Hey everyone, so today I wanted to talk about my whole timeline because I get lots of comments and questions from people that are confused by my timeline, that have questions about my reinstatement, what that looked like, what my polydrugging looked like, and sort of the whole journey because it is a little bit confusing, my story, and it is long and so I'll try to make it as short as possible without leaving out any details. So. If you've been following me for a while, you'll know that I took um, citalopram for seven years, which is an SSRI antidepressant. I was put on it for situational depression when I lost my job. I was not mentally ill by any means, but I was struggling. And I mean, in hindsight, I think a little bit of self-care and finding a new job would have fixed things. And actually they did fix things, but I had attributed it to the pill and maybe it was helping a little bit, I don't know, but that's why I was put on them and I was kept on them for seven years, which is a really long time. So fast forward through those seven years and I wanted to come off them. And the reason I wanted to come off them was because I was in some financial hardship and I wanted to cut out every single expense that I felt wasn't completely necessary for life. And at that point, I just didn't feel like the antidepressants were doing much. I didn't know if they were doing anything, but I was so desperate to get out of debt that I asked my doctor about tapering. He put me on a four week tapering schedule, which I now know was way too fast. I got symptoms quite quickly after stopping and, but I didn't attribute it to stopping the medications because I had never heard of an antidepressant withdrawal syndrome. I was never told about it by my doctor. I had no idea it even existed, but I started getting physical and mental symptoms that were pretty debilitating. And they went on for about six months and then I did get respite for several months. It was kind of weird the way it happened. I did do a brief reinstatement at seven months off because even though at six months, I was starting to feel quite a bit better, when I was at five months off, I was in crisis. And so I had called mental health crisis for help. I was referred to a psychiatrist. It was a two month wait. And in those two months, I really feel like my, a lot of my symptoms went away quickly, but I decided to go to the appointment anyway. I don't know why, but based on what she had done during my intake, the psychiatrist, she told me to base my symptoms and answers to the questions on the intake based on what had been going on for those six months, even though I was feeling better at that time. So I did, and then I was I walked out with a diagnosis of OCD, depression and anxiety, and a prescription for citalopram again, and Seroquel, which is an antipsychotic. And I didn't wanna take the antipsychotic, so I didn't fill that prescription, but I filled the, the citalopram prescription, which, was so stupid because I was feeling so much better. And I decided to start taking the drugs again because I was still having mild lingering depression, anxiety and OCD, but it was very mild, like I was completely functional. And so I reinstated my full dose of citalopram and I had an adverse reaction and I kept at it for about a week and I was so sick. I was like, I gotta stop taking these. So I only did that brief reinstatement and from the six month off mark to the one year mark, so a six month period, I felt way better. And then my symptoms started coming back and I had no idea why. And I was sort of like bracing for impact. Like, why is this happening? Make it stop. And if you follow me, my symptoms, my mental symptoms have always been the worst. And I was, when, when the symptoms came back, it was mostly the mental ones, the physical ones, like the fatigue mixed with insomnia, the depression, panic attacks, kind of DPDR rage, that didn't fully come back after, at that one year mark, but the looping intrusive thoughts, which are have been my worst symptom all along, were back full force. So I struggled, so this is now April 9, 2019. So then I struggled for another 18 months and in October of 2020, I was like, I've just had enough of this. I was still working though. Like I mentally, I was not well, but I was still able to work and I had to because I was still in a bad financial situation. So I was like, at this point I had found the forums like the depression or antidepressant forums and the benzo forums. If you're familiar, you probably know which ones I'm talking about. And so 
I decided at this point I was going to reinstate, but I was going to do a micro dose reinstatement because they talk about that in the forums and how it mitigates the chance chances of an adverse reaction if you do a low dose reinstatement. So my my original do dose of citalopram had always been 20 milligrams. So I reinstated half a milligram and I remember feeling bad right away. But at that point, I was kind of tired of the forums and everything that they talked about and I was back onto the whole support groups for antidepressants and drugs.com and askapatient.com and reading people's reviews and all of these reviews were saying give it a chance to work give these drugs a chance to work you'll feel worse before you feel better it's just startup effects and so at this half a milligram when I was feeling worse I was like I'm just gonna push through because I did feel good for the most part during those seven years on citalopram the first three years were the best and then i was starting to get breakthrough symptoms but i didn't recognize them at the time but compared to where i was at at this point being on the drugs was better so i was like i gotta just figure out a way to get back on them and within the first three days of taking that low dose i had my family gather together to pray for me because my mental symptoms were getting worse and they already were quite severe. And I had a pastor come over to pray for me. I had like oil put on my forehead and I was prayed over, laid hands on, like I was in bad shape. And I was like, I, I knew at a gut level it was from the drugs, but again, I was like, this is just startup effects. Even though when I first took Citalopram in 2011, I took 20 milligrams right off the bat. I didn't even work my way up to a higher dose. I started at that dose and I don't even remember having any startup effects. But this time I'm like half a milligram, but I was convincing myself that it was psychosomatic. So I was like, I'm just gonna push through. But I was at a gut level, I knew something was wrong. So, but I was determined to get back up to a therapeutic dose. So I started at half a milligram. I went up to one, 1 1.5, two and 2.5. And at those low of doses, I think it, I think one or two days out of that, I took like a 10 milligram dose, which is really stupid of me. I shouldn't have been playing with the doses so much, but I was so desperate for these mental symptoms that I'd been suffering with for two and a half years at that point to go away. I had just had enough. And so this is probably, so I reinstated October 26th of 2020. These low doses, was playing around with the doses, did a couple 10 milligram doses, and then I was having these episodes where I would collapse. Like I would just feel like I would, I would get like this tunnel vision and basically fall. Like I would, I don't know, it wasn't fully passing out. Like I wasn't unconscious, but I was collapsing and my blood pressure would drop and my heart rate would skyrocket. And it got really bad one day. And I was worried because, you know, I, I have diabetes and I have other medical conditions. So I was like, this doesn't seem good. So I went to the ER and I had explained, you know, I started taking my antidepressant again. I don't know if these symptoms are a reaction to that or something. And they said, well, just in case it is, we're not going to give you any. And so I was like, well, I've been taking them for, I think at that point, three weeks. And I said, should I just be stopping them? And they said, well, we want to figure out what's going on with you before we give you any medication or continue any medication. So I was admitted to the hospital for about three, four days. So this is heading towards the end of November. And I had seen an internist, I had seen resident doctors, uh, the regular like med surge floor doctors, and I had all this testing done and nobody could really figure out what was wrong and what had been going on. And I was brave enough at that point to tell them my mental symptoms. And of course they sent a psychiatrist up and she did an assessment on me and she's like, you have severe OCD, like, and you have other mental stuff going on you have a severe anxiety problem clinical depression and so she put me on Effexor or she prescribed me Effexor but I refused to take it because I had talked to a few people at this at that point that had really struggled with that drug and struggled coming off it and were having pretty extreme withdrawal reactions so I refused Effexor and she wanted to buffer or bolster what I was taking with an antipsychotic. So I ended up with a prescription for Prozac and Risperidone, which is the antipsychotic. So I was discharged from the hospital and I was scared to take 
any more pills, but I was so desperate for relief. So I got the liquid version of Prozac and I started taking only two milligrams, even though I was prescribed 10. And I felt bad. I started getting suicidal thoughts. I started feeling disoriented and like DPDR. My ears started ringing and I hadn't had tinnitus yet up to this point at all. So I was like, this can't be good. So after four days of taking that, I called the psychiatrist and said, I don't think I'm doing well with this drug. And she said, and I was really drowsy, but yet activated. And she said, okay, well, let's try Zoloft. So I try Zoloft, I take one pill. Again, I was taking a small dose. I don't remember what dose. And my thoughts started to like speed up like it was chipmunks talking and it freaked me out. So I was like, okay, I'm not taking Zoloft. I did take the Respiridone. I think I only took like half a milligram or one milligram and I didn't feel anything from it. So I was just like, this isn't working for me. So I was like, I'm gonna go back to the tried and true citalopram. So I go back on citalopram and again, I don't remember my exact doses, but I was, it was around maybe two and a half to five milligrams. And I took that for 11 days. And so this is getting into December of 2020. And then I started feeling creepy, crawly, buzzing, restless feelings in my legs. And I'm like, oh no, because I had knew about akathisia at that point, And I started to really freak out. I, I couldn't sleep. I had this and it was more than just restless legs. It was just this really terrible feeling in my legs. And I knew that akathisia typically started in the legs. So I was really freaked out. Um, and I didn't know what to do. So I stopped taking the citalopram and I, I can't remember. I'm just trying to remember exactly what happened. The akathisia, like or whatever was going on in my body, started to get worse, and my mental symptoms were really sped up. The violent thoughts, I was starting to feel sensations from the thoughts, and it was it was really starting to scare me. I was starting to my muscles were starting to kind of jerk a little bit and move, and I was getting really scared. And at one point during that time, I hadn't slept for five days. So I was kind of out of my mind at this point. I'd quit my job and I was really struggling to function. And so I reinstated October 26th. This was about mid early December and I was non-functional. I, I, had, th I had had three jobs. I quit them all. I was mostly housebound. I was having, I would lay down to try to have a nap because I was so tired and I would get what felt like a bomb going off in my head. I would hear almost like a gunshot and it would, and I'd get this rushing through my body that would just spring me out of bed. So I couldn't sleep. So I went five days without sleep. And I remember just walking around the apartment on the fifth night. And just I just felt completely disoriented. And like the walls were closing in on me. And I just was like, what is happening to me? And I just was, was so activated. And I'm walking around and walking around. And I'm like, this is insane. And I just had this terror. And... I had these horrible thoughts and they were getting so violent that my body was was jerking in response to them because they were always like self-harm, violent blows to the body that I was having in my head. So my body would, would react in response to it and I was just flailing around in my bed and I remember just trying to sleep but I couldn't rest and I was like dodging all this stuff that was going on in my head. It was just horrible and at someone it must have been in the hospital or at some point during that journey, I had been given 10 Ativan. And so I'd never taken a benzo before. I knew the dangers of benzos, but I was so desperate. So one night after five nights of no sleep, I'm like, I'm just going to take one Ativan. And they were one milligram tablets. They were just tiny. And I put it under my tongue and it worked like a charm. I slept all night that night. And I remember just feeling so much relief from finally getting some sleep. And I, I remember it kind of like slowed my thoughts down and took away some of that feeling in my body and the cortisol rushes and the bomb going off in my head and just all of these symptoms that I was suffering from. And I was like, this is a miracle pill. But I was like, and I, so then the next night I'm like, I'm gonna take another one. And so then in my head, I was telling myself, I'm only gonna take four because I'm like, I won't get addicted to benzos after four pills, but I just, I love the sleep. It, it was taking away like 75% of my symptoms. So I took benzos for four days and I'm like, oh, I just wanna take all 10. Like not all at once, but I wanna take one a night for 10 nights. And I was really active in the forums again. And they were like, well, if you only take benzos short term, you can stop if you only are gonna take them for four days. Or if you take the 10, then you should just do, you know, a quick, 
taper, like cut in half and then a quarter and then stop. And so I was like, oh, I was really debated because I was like, I don't want to get addicted to benzos. I've already had enough trouble with antidepressants, but I was just so desperate and I felt functional for the first time in six weeks. So I take all of the out of that and then I'm like, I need to get more. And I sound like a crazy dependent at this point, but when you're suffering so much, you, and you've been suffering for so long, you just are so thankful for any relief. So I remember going back to a doctor. I didn't have a proper GP, general family doctor at that point. So I was going to the walk-ins and I was able to get another 30 day supply of benzos through a walk-in doctor, which is not very common, but I guess I'm good with words or I convinced her that I needed them because I felt like I did. So I get this prescription for 30 Ativan. And so I started taking the Ativan regularly, but then it was quite quickly that it was wearing off too fast. So then according to the forum advice, I started cutting the dose and splitting it. So I would take half in the morning and half at night. And then that wasn't enough. Then I started taking it three times a day and then I was upping it to a milligram and a half three times a day. So I would take half in the morning, half in the afternoon or like at supper and half before bed. And after about a month of Ativan, or maybe not even a month, I was like, this just ain't doing it anymore. Not like it did at the beginning. And I was just like, this cannot be happening. I, I had this respite and now I feel like it's just not doing anything anymore. And I'm taking it three times a day, like what the hell? And so soon after that, it started feeling like it was going paradoxical. So I would take a dose and I would start to shake within an hour of taking it. And then I would take the next dose, like later on in the day, and then I my muscle jerking was getting worse. And so I'm like, I had heard about paradoxical reactions to benzos, but I'm like, is that what's happening to me? And I was getting really scared. So January rolls around and I'm still taking Ativan. And at that point, I forgot to mention when I was in the hospital, uh, Maybe I went to the hospital a second time. It's kind of muddied. Like I was, I had seen so many doctors during this time. One of them ended up giving me propranolol. So in January rolls around, I'm taking propranolol and I'm taking Ativan. And then I had discovered this wonderful new drug-free treatment for OCD and depression called TMS. So transcranial ma magnetic stimulation. So I'm on the computer all day researching and I decide this is what I need. So I find a way to get it covered through insurance. The only place that they did it was three hours away in the big city from where I live. And I was familiar with that city because I had lived there prior for several years. So, but I'm like, where am I gonna stay? Cause it's 40 treatments over 40 days. So an old friend of mine ended up having a an open basement suite and he said, you know, I'll rent it to you for cheap for the month and a half or whatever. And I was like, oh, you're the best. And so my mom comes with me, we pack up for a month and we, we go three hours away and I start getting these treatments. And so the first little bit, I'm like, okay, I can tolerate this. Nothing seems to be getting worse. So I'm gonna continue with it. But they slowly amp up the power and the strength of the treatments and the whole clinic is overseen by a psychiatrist so I'm like okay I'm gonna be in this psychiatrist's care she can be kind of guiding me through you know taking the Ativan the propranolol I'm gonna be getting the TMS I felt like I was in good hands but after about a week of getting the TMS I felt like I was getting worse and I'm like this can't be happening. And I was so distraught because my symptoms, my mental symptoms were getting ext to extreme crisis levels. Um, like I was having these tactile hallucinations, just extreme looping mental intrusive thoughts nonstop. And I remember just being so upset in her office because we would have reviews regularly, like every day or every other day. And so she's like, you need to be on a tricyclic antidepressant. I said, I don't think I can tolerate antidepressants anymore. And she said, well, this is a different class. It's not an SSRI and it's very well known to be treatable or to treat OCD. So it was an Afrinil or Clomipramine. And uh, I was really scared. I hesitated to take it because it was, it was a pill that couldn't be broken up into smaller doses. And I was terrified to take full doses. So I convinced her to give me a prescription for Luvox and Seroquel because I had been reading all this stuff online and saying, you know, 
if you have like extreme OCD, then you need to be on antidepressants, but it can be helpful to be have them boosted with an antipsychotic. And I had tried Risperidone with no results and had been prescribed Seroquel a couple of years before and never took it. So I decide, I convince her to give me a prescription for Luvox because Fluvoxamine or Luvox is another one. It's an SSRI, but it's known to be good for OCD. It's a sedating SSRI. So I'm like, okay, She's like, okay, I'll give you the prescription for Luvox. I'm still on Propranolol. I'm still on Ativan. And she adds Seroquel to the mix. And I'm getting TMS. So I take Seroquel for five days. I start at 6.25 milligrams and I go up to 12 and a half. And I'm not even kidding. Like I start pooping blood like profusely on the Seroquel. And I'm telling the psychiatrist this and she's like, it's not possible that it's from the Seroquel. And I'm like, well, I've never had this in my life. Like, or if I, I think I had one episode years and years prior where I had had some bleeding um but it was not like this this was like persistent and scary like it was scary amounts and she says okay so I'm still in this other city and she says you need to go to a walk-in doctor and get checked out I'm sure you probably just have hemorrhoids or something so I get like anally probed <laughs> sorry this is like TMI but I feel like it's important to share and the guy's like there's nothing wrong with you. And I'm like, why am I, is there so much blood every time I have a bowel movement, like tons of blood, like the whole toilet's like red. He's like, oh, I don't know. So I start looking up Seroquel side effects and one of them is gastrointestinal bleeding. And I'm like, why is no one telling me, not only are they not telling me this, but then they're denying that it's possible. And I'm like, it's right here. So I'm getting, I'm starting to get frustrated. So I'm like, I take the Seroquel for five days and I'm starting to pace and I remember being in the clinic and walking back and forth and pacing and I go into her office and I'm like dancing like I have to pee and she's like, are you okay? And I said, no, like I just have this horrible feeling in my body. I can't sit down. I'm just out of my mind. I'm having absolutely nonstop every second flashes of like violent intrusive thoughts, hallucinations. I'm pacing like I, I was, I was tortured. I, I really was by the system I, I was and so I'm like I'm not taking the Seroquel anymore I'm like pooping blood I'm out of my damn mind I can't sit down I can't like the only thing I could do was sleep because Seroquel would make me like pace but at night it would feel like I had a brick on my head and it would absolutely knock me out cold so I think because I took it at night but then during the day I was like having all this bleeding and pacing and it was horrible and I felt like after 11 days, I was like, I feel like this TMS is making me worse. I am completely non-functional at this point. Um, I'm on the phone with my support group all day. So I'd started to support or to form this small support group of other women who were going through this. There was only two or three of us at that time. And I'm on the phone with them video chatting all day. My mom is getting really annoyed because we're in this other city. And she's like, all you do is talk to people all day on the phone. Like you're, you're acting crazy. And I'm like, I cannot function. Um, and so... I quit the Seroquel, but I'm taking the Luvox because I'm able to chop it up and I have this hundredth of a milligram scale where I'm weighing it out. I'm taking like these tiny doses and I have these chips of tablets lined up on the coffee table. And I'm like, this is what I'm taking today. This is what I'm taking tomorrow. I'm like determined that something is going to work for this mental stuff. So I quit the Seroquel, but I'm taking the Luvox. I'm taking Propranolol. I'm taking Ativan. I'm getting TMS. So... I start taking the Luvox and I start seeing faces. I'm, I'm seeing these like demonic faces, teeth, um, these dark figured men walking. Um, I'm starting to see like upside down crosses, crucifixes. Like it was real messed up. Like I'm, I feel like I'm becoming completely psychotic. And I was like, do I need to, like, should I be admitted to the psych ward? Cause they have a big psychiatric center in that city and I'm like I am never going to be able to function again and I have like a long conversation with my mom and I said mom I just I can't keep doing this TMS so after only 11 days that we pack up everything and we come back home and again I'm still taking Ativan I'm still taking Propranolol and I'm taking Luvox and so this is the and sorry, this is the beginning of February now. So we're back home. I'm completely out of my mind, non-functional non again, can't do anything. So um, I, I was starting to get really fed up and I'm like, obviously these pills are poisoning me. Like, what am I doing? 
like I'm like talking to myself like Melissa what are you doing like this is not you even close you're having all these involuntary movements you're having psychotic mental symptoms um you're pacing around you're pooping all this blood like I was in bad shape you guys like bad 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 shape and I so I'm like I'm gonna start tapering so I stopped taking the Luvox because I'm like, I'm seeing all these faces and it's driving me crazy. I'm still pooping all this blood, but I'm like, and I'm like, the Ativan's not even working anymore. It's, it feels like, I feel like it's causing symptoms. So I'm going to do a micro taper. So I'm at, I'm taking back to taking one milligram a day split up. And I'm going to, I'm like, I'm going to start cutting a hundred hundredth of a milligram a day. So I'll get down to zero in a hundred days. And the forums were trying to tell me, oh, stabilize on the benzo and then taper over two years. I'm like, no, I've had it with these drugs. Like I'm at the point where I just feel completely like I'm poisoning myself. I just, I cannot do this anymore. And so I'm like, I'm doing it my way. And I just, I wouldn't listen. I got a warning point on there. I don't know how I didn't get banned because I was just getting so mad. And I'm like, starting to taper, I get down to 0.6 milligrams of Ativan. And I am, okay, so I had stopped working my three jobs, but then I had one, one of those jobs was teaching English, English online where I could determine my hours. I could work when I wanted as little or as much as I wanted. So when I was better coping before the reinstatement, I was teaching a lot. And so at this point, I'm like, I have to get some type of income. So I'm just teaching like one to two classes a day and I'm barely able to do that. And I'm bawling before my classes and I'm trying to taper the Ativan and I feel completely abandoned by everyone and I feel so alone. And the forums are mad at me and giving me warning me warning points and I'm like, they're gonna ban me. I'm, I'm alone, I'm, I'm totally alone. I was living with my mom, but she didn't understand what was going on yet. She just didn't get it. Nobody got it, nobody in my family. I, I didn't really have any friends left except for my support system. So I'm just like in complete survival mode. So February 21st rolls around and I'm at 0.6 Ativan. Um, that doesn't make sense because then I would have been tapering for 40 days. I must have started, I, I started getting impatient. I think once I got to 0.8 and then I was, I was cutting 0.002. That's how it happened. I started to fast track it because I'm like, I got to get off this drug. And I'm not medically supervised. Nobody's helping me. Um, the psychiatrist in the city I had gotten TMS, she was kind of doing follow-ups with me and wanted me to continue on the Ativan for life. And I'm like, no, I'm done. And so I get down to 0.6. And at this point, my muscle jerking and involuntary movements are so severe that my mom calls 911. I'm, my whole body is flailing around. My arms, my legs, everything is jerking. I have pulsating electricity, shocking nerves, vibrations, screaming ears, extreme intrusives, tactile hallucinations. Like I'm a mess. And I think I was still pooping blood at that point. And so I'm like, I'm gonna die. Like I'm, I'm gonna die. Um, so I end up in an ambulance. I'm in the ER. Of course, I get gaslit in the ER. Well, this is just anxiety. I'm like, well, first of all, like, like this massive amount of blood in my stool is not in my head. And I'm like, the involuntary movements, like, I'm not faking it. That's not from anxiety. Like, give me, are you a real doctor? Like, are you kidding me? I was so angry. And, you know, they're just treating me like a psych patient. So they throw me in the psych ward. And I'm, like acting it makes me wonder you know you see even it de depicted in movies like psych patients and people in straight jackets and screaming and tugging and they're like at me you know and they look crazy but i wonder if it's just from the torture of the treatment like that's how i felt i was not yelling but i was hysterical because i'm having these extreme mental symptoms and I'm psych I, I felt psychotic and I'm having all this these involuntary movements and you get looked at like you're just you're just crazy and you need to be in the ward. So they pull me off Ativan and they up they start giving me propranolol every time I start jerking, which is pretty much all the time. So they're like they're like giving me propranolol, propranolol, propranolol. They took me off the Ativan because I told them I they must have believed that I was having a reaction to it. Um, or one of the nurses or doctors must have believed me because I was seeing, I saw several doctors in the ER, in the hospital, and then in the ward. Um, and so I'm in the psych ward and they pulled me off Ativan and then the psychiatrist does his like intake and he said, 
you need to be on clomipramine. You need to be on an afranil. You have severe, severe OCD with like psychosom or not psychosomatic, somatic hallucinations. Um, and I'm like telling him I'm really sensitive to meds. I feel like the meds are causing this. I need to take a low dose and build my, and he just laughed at me. And I was just, I felt so degraded. I felt so disrespected and just like, it was, it was, I had went from this working three jobs, like, well, even prior, like when I was on antidepressants the first time working this like well-paying leadership job to coming off, going into withdrawal, suffering, but still working, reinstating. And then I'm completely non-functional. And then I'm getting like scoffed at and like I saw I had been like so at this point I saw a couple different psychiatrists and I, I, I was just mistreated by all of them except the one that was the TMS she was at least reasonable with me but I I, I just well I ended up leaving because of the TMS I felt like was making me worse so I come back I'm like I'm not seeing the psychiatrist again I demand to see a different one. So I see a different one and I get prescribed, you know, it was Iprexa and um, what was an, a, another SSRI and I don't even know, like all these different drugs. And I'm just like, you know what? I, I think it was my third day in the psych ward. I'm like, I've had it. I've had it. And I was just like, I'm, I'm, I'm so done. I'm like, give me the, the damn discharge papers. You people have ruined my life. I was never like this before the drugs. On the drugs, I functioned, but after a few years, I was starting to have suicidal thoughts and I was starting to get OCD creeping in and I was having nocturnal panic attacks. And I'm like, I was a vibrant, healthy woman before you guys poisoned me with these drugs that I never needed because I only took because I lost my job. Like, are you kidding me? And now this has been such a long journey. Now I'm completely non-functional. I'm like a psychotic patient and nobody believes me. And so I'm like, I'm out of here. And they're like, well, we don't recommend that. And I'm literally standing in the psych ward. I'm pacing around the psych ward at different times. And I, my whole body, at one point, I was standing in front of a nurse. And my body, I was standing like this. And my body was folding in half like this. Like my muscles in my like torso were contracting constantly. And she's like, oh my God, like, do you want something to drink? And I'm like, there's something wrong with me. Like somebody tell me what's wrong with me. But it was just more pills, more pills, more pills. So I'm like, I'll sign whatever damn papers I need to. I'm out of here. I was so angry. So I signed the discharge papers. They had cold turkeyed me off the Ativan. I refused all the other drugs they gave me. And I'm like, I've had it. And at that point, it was like a light bulb went off. And I'm like, Melissa, listen to your instinct. This whole time, deep down, I've been like, the drugs did this to me in the first place. But I let the forums and, you know, the online reviews of these wonderful drugs get to me and just everybody's different opinions that I was talking to and I was so desperate for help and reaching out and everyone telling me I'm mentally ill and I'm like but I never was mentally ill never until I took these drugs and then I started reading like the patient information leaflets which I was never given for any of the drugs I started reading the FDA warnings the black box warnings and I'm like like I'm just blown away that these drugs are given not only given out like candy but even allowed like I'm like this is absurd you're you're taking an antidepressant for your depression that says can cause suicidal thoughts aggression and violence like that is not the result of happy chemicals that is like an antidepressant that causes suicidal thoughts like something's wrong like why is nobody like hello and i i just left and i was so angry but i was i was like determined to get through this and i was determined to heal and i'm like i am so done and so that's when the hell, because I'm, I'm off Ativan, the only drug I was taking at that point was Propranolol. So I'm jerking and jerking and jerking. I'm, I, again, I'm still just absolutely in such bad shape. So I was like, I need more specialized. I need someone to look at me. Like I need someone to tell me what is wrong. Because in the psych ward, they're like offering me water when I'm having these movements. All they could give me were more psychiatric drugs and like, some propranolol as a PRN as needed. And I'm like, I need someone to look at me and validate what's wrong and what's going on with me. So I'm going in and out of the walk-in clinic now. And I'd seen every psychiatrist that was available here. I was done with psychiatry. 
Um, I didn't have a, a family physician, so I'm in and out of the walk-in clinic. I go to the walk-in clinic one day and I'm jerking, jerking, jerking. And the doctor's like, oh my God, you need a neurologist. And I'm like, you think? And so she's like, okay, I'm going to refer you to a neurologist. And here in Canada where I live, it's a six to 12 month wait for a neurologist. And it's not like in the US where I can just fork out some money and see one right away. You're kind of at the mercy of the system. So I'm like, I don't think I can't wait that long. And she's like, I'll try and fast track it. But I don't know this woman. She doesn't know me. And so I I left feeling a little tiny bit of relief because I'm like, okay, maybe someone's actually going to believe me now and, and see that like, this is not anxiety. Like, I'm pretty sure a five year old could see that. So I'm I'm continuing to get worse physically. And so March, so March rolls around and I'm desperate again for some help. I had been reading online that Lamictal or Lamotrigine can help stabilize the CNS. And it's not a psych drug per se. I believe it's a, I don't want to say for sure. I don't, not an anti-seizure. Maybe it's an anti-seizure. I don't know. It's in a slightly different class of drug. And so I was, I was like, okay, I'm going to ask about that or I just need help. I, I need help and I need to see a neurologist faster. So one day I'm like, I'm going to go back to the walk-in clinic. It was on a weekend and I think it was the weekend. I think, yeah, it was a Saturday and I was on my way there. And one of my friends in my support group calls me and she's in crisis. So I pull over to the side of the road and I go for a walk and I'm talking to her and I'm trying to support her. And then I said to her, hey, like, I got to go. I, I have to go to, like, I talked to her for about an hour. And I said, you know, the walk-in clinic's going to close. I really need to see a doctor. And I need to get to the bottom of what's going on with me. I knew it was the drugs, but I needed someone to validate it for me. And so I go to the walk-in clinic. I end up being the last patient of the day. And this little, little short doctor walks in. And I've never seen him before. And I'd been to so many, like I'd been to so many doctors at the, at the walk-in clinics here. I don't live in a very big city and I feel like I've seen everybody at this point, but I've never seen this guy. And I'm like, do you work here? And he said, no, I actually don't work at this clinic. I work at a different clinic, but they needed me today. So here I am. And I'm bawling my eyes out. I'm, I'm moving my, I'm jerking. I'm just hysterically crying and I'm pouring out my story to this random doctor and he sat with me for an hour and I mean I don't know what it's like where you live but normally when you see a doctor here it's like 10 minutes in and out and a walk-in clinic it's like five minutes in and out this man spent an hour with me he listened to my whole story and he's like I want to help you and I said like I'm supposed to see a neurologist but it's not like I need to see someone soon and he said okay like I'll do everything I can and then I said I need you to take me on as a patient I've never had a doctor, like, this was the first time I felt heard in all these months months and respected and treated like a human being and someone who believed me. And so he's like, well, I'm not taking any new patients because I'm like begging him to take me on as a patient. He's like, well, I'm not taking any new patients, but I'll make an exception. And so he's like, call my clinic on Monday, you know, here's where I work and my receptionist will set up an appointment. And I'm thinking, yeah, like this doctor's he's going to leave here and forget all about me. So I call on Monday. Sure enough, they knew who I was. They got me in quickly to see him. And like this man changed my life. So he validated, he got me in to see the neurologist in two weeks. He validated everything I was going through. Um, I was diagnosed with akathisia and uh, generalized musculoskeletal movement disorder. And I, he, he puts me on disability. So I felt like, okay, I'm finally on the right path now. So I go and see the neurologist in two weeks and she, she also validates that I have benzo damage or I, she didn't call it ban damage. She said benzo withdrawal. That was what she, what, what she said. Um, and I had like the scans and like the brain scans and stuff done. And of course, just like everybody else in this, they didn't actually see anything structural or, um, like physically wrong that they could see in my brain like there wasn't any bleeding or I don't know what they look for trauma or whatever um and so I was so thankful for her and for my new GP so I'm put on disability 
and I haven't taken it. Oh, so then I, I, I was still taking propranolol and my, my GP, so this new Jeep, wonderful GP I had, this family physician was like, you're not taking nearly a high enough dose. Cause I think I was taking 30 milligrams of propranolol or maybe 20. And he said, I want you on 120. And I'm like, that's a lot. And I'm still scared of drugs. I knew it wasn't a psych drug. Um, I had quit everything else and I, I was like, okay, but I have to go up slowly. And he's like, yeah, that's fine. Like split your dose three times a day and work your way up to 120. So I go from 30 to 40 to 50 to 60 to 70 to 80 to 90. Once I hit 90, I started to feel better. And the movements were mostly stopping and all of the like pulsating, shocking electric feelings were way better. My mind was still a mess though. And he was like, you are not taking any more psych drugs. Like, I will not give you any. And I was, I was so relieved to hear that and shocked that a doctor would say that, honestly, after everything I had been through. And so this doctor is still my doctor to this day. Uh, he was my doctor through my pregnancy. He has been an absolute godsend for me. And he's like, Melissa, I'm willing to do anything for you. So I'm so thankful. It was like a divine intervention, I'm convinced. Because I would not have had that experience, I don't believe, if my friend wouldn't have called me on my way to the clinic and I wouldn't have ended up being the last patient of the day where he spent an hour with me. It just, that's that's the whole story. And I And then my timeline after that, because I feel like people still get confused about when I started improving. So I quit the drugs in February, on February 21st, 2021 but I was still taking propranolol up to 90 milligrams. Then in April of 2021, I think it was the end of April, I was like, you know what? I just don't wanna be on any pharmaceuticals anymore. My physical symptoms were a lot better on the propranolol, but I just, propranolol is not supposed to be taken long-term by diabetics because it can mask the symptoms of low blood sugar. I've been a diabetic for 25 years. I was starting to feel like it was making me a little bit depressed um, and it was making me gain weight. So I was like, I don't wanna take this anymore. And you know, the forums would say, do a long micro taper. I'm like, I'm done with micro tapers. Um, and I, I took the chance myself and stopped cold turkey. I'm not, I would not recommend that to anybody. I, I think, you know, you have to do what is best for you and what your doctor thinks you should do. I quit and I was okay. Um, and so I've been totally drug free since April of 2021. But I've been psych drug free since February of 2021. So I'm I struggled and struggled and struggled and struggled for the first six months off. So from February to August, I had no windows. Um, and that's why it looks like it's because some people will say I'm five years off because I originally quit my original citalopram in April of 2018, reinstated in October of 2020, messed around, got poly drug for three months, finally quit everything, all psychiatric drugs in February on February 21st of 2021 um, and then quit propranolol in April of 2021. I didn't get my first window until August and that was like a one hour window. And it wasn't even complete symptom relief. It was just, I felt like there was hope. And then at that point I was, so I started to feel better. Like, so then I had my first window and then Around that time also, the movements, because I was off the propranolol, the movements just like improved rapidly at the six month mark and they mostly went away unless I was stressed. And then I, and then it was isolated to just my upper body and the lower body stuff had quit. Um, so I had that one hour window and I was seeing my ex-boyfriend at this time because I still was extremely bad mentally, extreme, like this all day long, just like intrusives, intrusives and hallucinations. And it was torture. And my only respite from that was sex. So I had reunited with my ex-boyfriend and I, that was my only escape. It was the only time I wasn't tormented by my own mind. And so I ended up getting pregnant. So I got pregnant, in, which was not supposed to be possible for well, I had a less than 5% chance of that happening. Um, that's a whole other story. I have made videos about that. Um, and so my symptoms ramped up again from the hormones of pregnancy. So the first trimester was a nightmare. The second trimester was when I was a year off and I started getting more windows where I'd get like a three hour window or a half a day window. Then back to like the third trimester was bad again. 
postpartum was really bad the first three months. Um, and so I was three months postpartum in August of 2022. Then in November of 2022, I felt like I started to turn a corner. So November of 2022, I was 20 months off. And then I was starting to get longer windows. And I was like, okay, I'm going to beat this. And that was the first time in four and a half years where I really was like, I'm going to beat this. Because my first withdrawal, I suffered so much for two and a half years. But I didn't have... Um, the movements and the akathisia until I reinstated, took benzos and was polydrugged. That was at the end of 2020. Um, and so I didn't really get windows because my symptoms were so bad mentally in my first withdrawal. Um, they were worse in the second one, but in the first one, I was still not sensitive to stuff. So I was taking like, I would take NyQuil to try and sleep. I would um, I was taking antibiotics because I, I was getting all kinds of infections. I was drinking alcohol regularly throughout my first withdrawal. Never had a window. Two and a half years. That's why I reinstated. Everything got way worse. And then I developed the movements and the akathisia. Then I went, you know, got pregnant. And I didn't really feel like I was getting proper long windows until 20 months off that second withdrawal. Or that second Re, like that reinstatement which is four and a half years after I first quit Citalopram so long 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 journey um and you know so I, so that November 2022 is when I felt like I turned a corner and then I was doing quite well November December the end of November though I had to take antibiotics uh and that after the second pill, I was walking around pacing all night and showering at 3 a.m. and trying desperately to get the feelings out of my body. And so I had a setback from that. That lasted till like Christmas because I, I took the antibiotics November, I think 22nd or 23rd. I took them for 10 days. I pushed through and took them because my infection was really bad. Um, I was done the antibiotics December 2nd. And then by Christmas, I was starting to feel better again. So I had a setback for about three weeks from the antibiotics. I guess from when I started the antibiotics, it was about a month of a setback. Because I got it. I started like having a reaction to it after the second pill, which was like November 22nd, 23rd. So yeah, I had a month setback from antibiotics. I started feeling good again around Christmas. I felt good um, December, January, February. I was still getting waves though. But I mean, the windows were getting longer and like... 95% symptom free and then I had another setback in so it's May now last month and that lasted about five weeks I don't even know what triggered it I did have a really severe cold I didn't take antibiotics or anything for it it was the first like it, it's so confusing too because when I took those antibiotics in November I took them for an infection, but it turned out that I had mold in my apartment. So I think I took the antibiotics for nothing. I was reacting to the mold. So I, it's a long story I have. So I moved in February. So I had a ton of stress from moving and, but I had to get out of the mold. And then I developed an actual proper, like severe cold. And, uh, that was in, excuse me, must've been the end of March, beginning of April had a setback from that that lasted four or five weeks then i started recovering from that but i have a lot a lot going on because i have my baby i'm a single mom um, i've started slowly working again although i'm still on disability I'm, I'm building that up um you know had the stress of moving it's just i've got you know it, it's just like setback after setback after setback but overall i'm doing since november i'm doing way better way better than i had the previous four and a half years so that's a very long video, but I just want to clarify and I don't, I don't want people to think that I'm being misleading or anything, but I do have a confusing muddied timeline because of the reinstatement, um, you know, quitting it originally, reinstating, messing around with doses, polydrugging, and also it, it's a, it was a very traumatic time. So your, your memory gets, I do have a journal I could refer to, but I I can think more clearly now, but a lot of the time, like your memory is muddied from that time because it's so traumatic. And not only that, but that I'm still in the 
like kind of postpartum phase and when you have a baby they say you have baby brain and that's so true like my memory is not perfect but I, I've been kind of rehearsing what I was going to say in this video for the last couple of days when I've been feeling really clear-headed and just referring back to my timeline and that's that's how things went for me so if you have any questions let me know in the comments I'd be happy to clear anything else up or answer, answer any questions you have or anything like that so yeah, I hope you guys are doing okay. Let me know in the comments and I'll see you next time. Bye.